The town of Acton, in response to COVID-19, is currently following the guidance from the Acton Board of Health, Mass, DPH, and CDC regarding the virus and steps communities can take to prevent the spread. The town hall is closed to the public. This meeting will be broadcast live, local access cable on Acton TV channel, or streaming online at the Acton TV. YouTube live channel and audio will be broadcast live on the radio on WAEM 94.9 FM. To participate remotely from a computer, please click on the link below to join the public meeting. Webinar HTTPS Zoom US 503-918-785 or from a telephone dial 646-876-9923 and enter webinar ID 503-918-785. Telephone users may dial star nine to request to speak after joining the meeting. Computer and app users may use the raise hand feature to request to speak. So we'll start if there are any citizens concerns. Okay. I, I see no hands raised, uh, John. Okay. All right. Well, let's go to John, town manager. Mr. Mangiretti. Hi, good evening, everybody. Nice to see you all again. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we've been continuing to uh, work uh, together collaboratively within the organization with, and with our community partners and, and our regional partners to, to address the challenges associated with this pandemic. Uh, we, one thing I wanted to make sure everybody received this week at, in, their, in their house, uh, at their household is this three or six page newsletter. And on one of the pages was a uh, application to mail uh, by, to vote by mail. So you can just cut that out and send it back in. Uh, there's also some useful links and information in here that uh, should help people if they have questions about where to get resources related to COVID-19 and, and town services as uh, we continue to work through this together. Uh, as of last week, the governor ordered everyone to wear face coverings when out in public when social distancing isn't an, uh, an option. Our local board of health also issued an order mirroring that and uh, adding a little bit to it related to some of our facilities such as the transfer station. Yesterday, the Baker and Polito administration announced their four phased approach to reopening the Commonwealth. And they didn't uh, provide a lot of detail, but they, they laid out the phases and, and how they are going to approach this and gradually step back into uh, a new normal is the fourth stage. Uh, so the first stage is, is starting out, which they're going to make more information available uh, on May 8th. May 18th is the day that the stay-at-home advisory was initially extended to. And we'll, we'll learn on May, 8th, May 18th whether the stay-at-home advisory will be extended. And if not, what uh, phase we'll be entering and, and how that will look. So uh, we're looking forward to that. And within our organization, we've been doing a lot of planning and thinking about that. Uh, we've talked to all the department heads and, and division heads about, you know, what does your operation look like um, in the, the next phase that we may be entering? And what, what do you need for resources to, to implement that? And then so on and so forth. Through, through the other three phases that have been identified. So that work is ongoing, and we would love any input that the board members have or concerns that you're hearing uh, from constituents about uh, how things will start to look. Uh, to make sure that we have a good way for residents to contact us, we've set up a hotline, 978-929-6619. And there are you know hundreds of phone numbers that you can call in town to get people and most of them you'll get a live person uh, but during this period we want to make sure that there's once one number that you absolutely will get a person to pick up if you call during business hours and the people that uh, answer that phone will be able to direct you to resources and help answer your questions and get you uh, information that you need so uh, I encourage you to take advantage of that uh, with annual town meeting that's on the agenda for later to this afternoon or tonight, I guess. 
Uh, we've been thinking about that and look forward to uh, direction from the board on, on when you want to hold that and, and any ideas you have about how to do it safely. We do have some ideas that we've been uh, thinking about and we were coordinating with the moderator and uh, hope to uh, hear input and ideas from the board tonight. Uh, and just a plug for our weekly program, Java with John. Uh, we've had a, a good run of, of guests giving a lot of great information to our community. And uh, this Friday is no different. We have a great guest speaker. Our town clerk, Eva, is going to join me on the program. And she's going to talk about the election. She's going to talk about what it's like to be a town clerk during this uh, situation. And uh, it's going to be great. So I encourage you to check it out. That's 10 a.m. Uh, May 15th. That's Friday on 94.9 FM and also on YouTube Live. Um, those are the general updates that I have uh, for tonight. John, a question, please. Yes. Yeah, uh, John. Um, with respect to the Board of Health um, adopting uh, Governor Baker's uh, or entering an order uh, on masks, mirroring uh, the governor's order, what was the um, addition with respect to the transfer station? Well, I th um, the Board of Health just specifically called out the transfer station as a place to remind people that even though it's outside, you still need to wear a mask if you can't okay. be socially. So it wasn't uh, much more than that, I don't, I don't believe. Okay, so, so that was the only extension of, of the Baker face mask order. And it, and it was local, yeah, and it was, and it was um, I think David Slockman Martin may have more details on that. Yeah, David, it, go ahead. Uh, the, the only other things, uh, uh, John, were that uh, basically you have to wear masks in all municipal buildings, um, even if you're the only one there. You know, you, uh, that, that's, that, that's their order. And um, uh, a selection of stores. So all, all municipal facilities, uh, all indoor municipal facilities, plus the transfer station, plus certain kinds of stores, you have to have a mask on, even if you're the only one there. So, but other places like outside, it's if, you know, if you can't be socially distanced from someone, you need to wear a mask. So it was the same thing as in the governor's order, to grocery stores, uh, retail stores. Right. The main addition was the municipal facilities. All municipal facilities. Okay. Right. Thank so you. If, you go in, if you go into the public safety facility, the transfer station, town hall, you need to wear a mask. Can you get into the town hall? Only <laughs> <laughs> yeah. if you have a key. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Now, can I ask one more or just one more note here? I, I didn't hear uh, John Mangerati, you mentioned this about when the municipal quarterly in there is an application. You can mail in to get your vote by mail sent to you. Yes. So, yeah, in, in six pages, um, back uh, front and back, and on one of the pages is is actually the application. You can just rip it out or cut it out, or you can mail the whole thing back in if if, uh, if that's easier. And if you mail this, or you can scan it in and send it to the town clerk as well, and they'll send you back a ballot to vote in the elections. If you're a registered voter, <laughs> I yeah, yeah I'm, I I had dropped Eva a note the other day. Um, I, I asked her, you know, how many mail-in ballots have you now received? Um, she said to date, um, um, with respect to absentee ballots, there were 321 local election requests, 161 state requests on the for the application on early voting ballots locally, um, uh, 1,051 and 792 for the state election. And of both groups, they said about 50% of those have been returned. That's good. Yeah. Uh, All right. Dean, yeah. Uh, two, two more quick items. Uh, I've gone to the transfer station a couple of times. The other change that they seem to have made is they've channelized the traffic a little bit better um, so that uh, I think they might have been having some backups out onto Route 2 because it was taking so long for people to uh, 
go through there. Uh, a couple of times I've been there have been uh, during the weekdays and there hasn't been any problem, but there's a, a lot more signage um, and it seems to be working quite well. Um, the, the other Good. item that I'd like to raise, even though there's nothing to do with this subject, um, there's a concern on the part of the design review board uh, that they're, they don't have enough members and they've been trying to get new members in there. And I told them I'd put a pitch in with the selectmen that in case anybody's watching and they might be interested in joining the design review board. It's a very important board. They're looking for people with some background in landscape architecture or architecture. So that's my 30 second pitch. Okay, great. All right, let's move on. John, North Acton Fire Station. Thank you. Yes, I'm very pleased to introduce the next item. It is a public hearing. Do you need to read any kind of notice to bring us in or? Just on the agenda, just says SPSP 0305 66 Harris Street, North Acton Fire Station. Okay, so uh, this is the site plan for the North Acton Fire Station on Harris Street. Um, as a municipal project, it's technically exempt from this permitting process, but in the interest of keeping the public in, engaged and, and also the board uh, involved, we wanted to take the opportunity to bring it before you and go through this process. And I think we'll, uh, it'll be great to have your, your thoughts and, and we hope you like where we're going so far. Uh, the design team is here with us as panelists to be making a presentation. I will be doing the slideshow um, from my screen. So I'm just gonna figure out how to share uh, right now. And uh, just to give you uh, just an update on where we are from a design standpoint, uh, since the, the special town meeting in December uh, that approved this project and the, and the election the following week, we've been uh, moving full speed ahead with the design and we're, we're uh, preparing to go out to bid for this project uh, within the next six weeks. And, uh, and this, this project uh, received approval uh, through the Conservation Commission earlier this week, or I guess it was last week. Um, and so tonight we're going to the Board of Selectmen uh, for a site plan uh, review process. Um, I'm sharing my screen. Oops. Sorry. Trying to share my screen. Okay, can you see that? No. Uh, is it? It's flying. It's loading. How okay. Now? So, I saw um, it a minute ago. the design no, team um, that we have. Okay. It, okay. So we have. Um, we have uh, Dave McKinley, who's gonna, the landscape architect, who's gonna run through the presentation and, and present the site plan. We also have our project manager, Kevin Witzel from Castle Boost, Todd Costa from Castle Boost, and our owner's project manager, Brian D. Philippus, are all uh, here. And who else is here? And the chief, Chief Hart is here as well. So oh, good. Uh, we have a, a good group of the design team here, and we, we look forward to hearing your comments. So uh, Dave McKinley, uh, you're on. You're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how about now? There we go. Looks like Sorry. Now. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. yes. Um, hello. Okay, so my name is Dave McKinley. I'm a registered landscape architect uh, working for Castle Booze. Um, uh, thank you for, we're, on, on behalf, we're working on behalf of the uh, North Acton Fire Building Committee, obviously. And uh, we submitted plans back in March. Um, we got some comments because there was a peer review of all of our drawings. 
the comments went back to myself and the civil engineer. We responded to the comments and sent those into the planning board. Uh, so we have the comments. I don't think uh, you really want to go through all of them. <laughs> there were a few comments that need special approvals from you. As we go through the presentation, I will ask for those special approvals as we go forward. So, John, if you can check the next slide. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, you probably are all very familiar where the site is. It's on Harris Street, 66. It's a two-acre site. Uh, we show, obviously, where the wetlands are. There are some wetlands on the site, and there are basically three buildings. The two buildings in blue uh, are going to be taken down, and the red building in the back, the garage, is going to be saved. The amount of impervious surface on the site, you can see, is in gray there. I have a little zoning table on the right-hand side, which talks a little about the setbacks and the coverage. We are in a FEMA X zone which basically means 1% to 0.02% chance of flooding. We are in a groundwater protection district. Um, and we've basically taken that into consideration when we did our uh, civil engineering and stormwater management. At this point in time, the only thing that we do not have uh, due to a high water table during the spring is information on a septic system. We haven't been able to get a successful perk test at this point in time, but we're continuing to try to do that Start to dry out, it'll be easier to do. Now I'll show you kind of where this septic system is going to go. So if you can go to the next slide. Okay. Okay, everybody see that? So this is this slide basically just shows the setbacks on the site. The setbacks both for the wetlands and the property lines. The front setback from Harris Street is 30 feet, while the side and rear lines are 10 feet. The important setbacks are the wetlands, and we've gone through conservation, um, gotten approvals for this. The, the setbacks are, basic, are not your normal setbacks, but they were dictated kind of by the corner of the existing garage that is staying on, on, on the uh, site. So we got an ANRAD uh, the last year, actually, an ORAD, I'm sorry, to verify that these are exactly the setbacks that will be accepted um, during the process. So we go to the next slide. I did you skip one? Oh well, okay. <laughs> we oh, had two sections. Two, two, two. There we go. This, these are just some pictures of existing conditions. You, I mean, you all know the buildings. The, the garage is on the right. That is staying is in the rear. Uh, we're going to keep the pad in front of it as well as the bollards. We're knocking down the two buildings on the either the right or the left. Uh, the bottom. Left-hand corner shows the woods behind the garage that's being staying, and we're putting the, this area is going to have the staff parking of 18 spaces. And then on the right-hand side, I show the neighboring house. It's the only time, we don't really have it on the survey, but I show you the proximity to the um, property line. And in a planting plan, you'll see later that we are trying to take into consideration buffering this house and giving them some privacy from the future fire station. Okay. Okay. Oh, we're, yeah. Next slide. So yeah, it's, it uh, these pictures are really just a sight lines uh, for no, that's all right. Uh, it gives me time to think. <laughs> um, the sight lines are, I think were important. We wanted to show you these because we located the building in the best location we thought on the site that would take advantage of the best sight lines going down either direction of Harris Street. Uh, you can see we've got a pretty good line viewed either east or west. Um, there was one comment um, by the peer review about a tree that they thought that should be taken down. 
at the southwest corner, which would be in view, the two bottom views, view west, is this tree that's kind of, you know, it doesn't have any leaves on it, but we're planning on taking that tree down because they thought that once it leaves out, it would be, it would block some of the sight lines. Okay. So this is the site plan. Um, as you can see, the, the, uh, the garage is in the rear. I'll start from the top and work way down. The, the staff parking, 18 spaces, is accessed by a road that hugs the western property line and comes down to Harris Street. There are three curb cuts onto Harris Street, which is something we have to get special permission to do as uh, for a special permit approval from you. Uh, of course, this is kind of mandatory um, from the standpoint of the way, just the function of the building. We don't want the apparatus uh, ap apron sharing and, and access with visitors and or the staff as they're pulling in for it would be dangerous. The, uh, the 24 foot wide um, driveway width is also something we have to get a special permit uh, requirement from approval from you. Once again, we have three apparatus uh, bays and we need a pretty wide apron in order to achieve that. So this is kind of a, you know, something a fait accompli, I guess. Um, working your way down, we have a small area between the garage and the existing building or the future building for a turnaround. Uh, the generator and the transformer for aesthetic reasons, we try to locate behind the building. We have a little walkway that goes along the back of the building. You'll see a white line on the kind of the retaining wall. And we put the retaining wall in just to, to have a minimal disturbance of the uh, wetland. You can see the, on this plan, there are the future grades are there. Due to the, wet, uh, the water table elevations, we had to lift the rear parking. Um, a little higher than we thought we were going to have, but that and that's why we've got kind of a steep slope uh, to the east of the staff parking. The building is about eleven thousand eight hundred fifteen square feet, which is, and the purpose uh, is uh, basically the the impervious in the building, I should say, basically double the impervious surface that, you, that is now on the site. But we have taken to, like I said, during the conservation uh, commission hearings, we basically have taken the stormwater management into consideration. There are underground retention, which I will show you on a, on a next on a future slide. The last thing I want to point out here is the visitor parking on the southeast corner of the site. Uh, we have handicap parking there. And we have two extra spaces for emergency pull-ins. We did try to uh, vegetate the front line in the uh, front property line. And we are installing, there is a plan to put sidewalks along the north side of Harris Street. And we are showing sidewalks as part of our plan to incorporate into that plan. There is going to be a future antenna in the back which is being pointed to the white area um, as a future amenity and you can see finally the vegetative buffer that I was talking about due to the house that was located just to the west of the property uh, we had some comments the um, peer review thought we should bump up the amount of vegetation so we didn't show we we're showing that on this plan we can go to the next plan This is a very simple, simple version of the site utilities plan. Uh, I won't spend too much time on it. It shows the buffers and it shows the underground retention areas as well as the outfalls into the wetland from these. Uh, one goes through the retaining wall in the middle. There's one catch basin by the visitor parking that just that, that, uh, has a little pipe down to the wetlands as well. And then the one above for the underground retention for the staff parking also extends toward the wetland. The reason they extend as far as they do is due to um, the grades, the, the depth, the height of the underground retention and the grades that we had to get to in order to have them overflow and empty. Go to the next slide, John.
this is a planting plan. Uh, we wanted to show you some of this. Most of the plants we're using are native plants. We didn't call each one of them out. We are showing some slope meadow mix on the slopes that are to the dark green. Uh, we're basically, you know, it's, it's there's shad blow and uh, cypress and witch hazel and some dogwoods, um, choke, cher choke berry, ink berry, some stuff that's uh, some classic stuff, but also some native uh, things that would fit into the area. We can go back to this if there's any specific questions on planting. At this point, I think I'm going to turn it over to either Todd or Kev Kevin. I'll let them decide to talk about the facade of the building and its materials. Thank you, David. Uh, this is Todd Costa from KBA. I'm one of the um, project architects and the uh, associate principal leading the project team of uh, both Kevin and David. Um, You've seen this. The building hasn't really modified a lot since it's been before you in previous rounds. Um, we have gone before the design review board and uh, presented this, heard some of their comments, addressed their comments uh, in this this iteration that you're seeing before you. Some of them were items like the bracing that you see along the front of the building. They wanted it to be a little bit heavier. The gray area right now that you can only see to the left of the building itself um, to remain all the way gray to the ground of uh, that material. That's a fiber cement material uh, with a base of uh, PVC so that we're not bringing the fiber cement too close to grade. Main body of the building itself is a split face block base with a cast stone cap and then brick in and of itself. Uh, that's finished off with a, another cast on cap at the top, and then it goes to fiber cement and uh, a clear story window. All of this is a low slope roof, although it does appear flat, it is a low slope with um, extended area for uh, photovoltaics to be installed. Um, next slide, please, John. Again, this is just kind of more of a straight on view, same principle of materials. We basically have the two forms, the form of the apparatus bay and the form of the living quarters. Those are both accented in the masonry um, product and then the subsequent areas all the way to the right hand side. Uh, that gray area is actually the dorm rooms and to the left hand side, that gray area is actually the um, support spaces or the fire apparatus as well as a mezzanine that incorporates some training aspects. Uh, next slide, please, Sean. I believe that concludes our presentation. Um, so basically, as David had um, indicated earlier, that we are seeking the site plan approval from the board. Okay, are there questions from the board members? Yeah. Um, uh, John, um, yes. you, you received the necessary approval from, from the COSCOM? Yes. Uh, earlier this, or I guess on Wednesday, they approved, uh, is it an order of conditions they approved, uh, Todd or David? Yes, it's the order of conditions, yes. Yes, order of conditions. Okay, so that's all we need from them. And um, when did you anticipate construction would begin? To, I can answer that. This is Todd again. Um, our anticipated uh, bid time is June. Um, we're, we're planning on putting this out to bid. It'll be about three, three to four weeks, depending upon how many questions are received for bidding. Uh, and then from there, it's usually about a month. Uh, so say July, we receive the bids back. Um, and it's usually about a month to negotiate contract and for them to to mobilize. So we're, we're looking late July, early August. Okay. Okay. Any other John, questions? Was there, from um, what, was there some discussion about uh, going with, with short-term notes for a year? Uh, yes, we we are coming to the Board of Selectmen on a week from tonight to discuss the financing strategy uh, 
Okay. But it's we're we're in uh, we're comfortable with what we recommend. Okay. Thank you. Any other members of the board with questions? Yeah, I have a question. All right, David. Yeah. Um. Did I did you show where the septic system was going? Did I miss that? Um. The septic system was not actually on our plans, but uh, if you, it's basically, if we can go back to the site plan, uh, or the civil plan, maybe. I'll do my best, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you go back for just to the planting plan, we can indicate on that. Yeah, that too. How's this one? It's going gonna, it's gonna to be in the front. Uh, so yeah, basically, it's going to be that lawn area in between the visitor parking and the apparatus bay. Apparatus apron, sorry. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a. I, I just basically have a question about process here. Um, you mentioned the curb cuts. I I thought that uh, public town projects were exempt from zoning, so. Are you asking us to issue a, a vote on an actual site plan permit? Usually we would have a draft of a permit and and I didn't see that in the package, so. Uh, from what I, our understanding when we got the peer review comments back, the peer review comments specifically said that we would need three special permit approvals from you. One, the three access driveways. Two, the request for the wider and 24 access drives to street. And the third one would be the proposed handicap and visitor spaces do not meet the 30 foot setback requirement and require special permit approval as well. In terms of uh, how it works, uh, having the permit ready, uh, that was, we were not informed of how exactly how that would process. Yeah, no, usually planning uh, would make a recommendation and, and I, I thought it was before the hearing, but maybe after we vote on it. I don't know, but um, usually planning would have a draft decision for us. So, well, let's okay, take, so, well, we, let, let's sorry. take them one at a time. Is there a motion to approve the three driveway entrances? Uh, Joan, there is Joan, our, our two members of the public who would like to make comments as well. Okay, let's hear from him. Barry, you're on. Unmute. Am I, is, can you hear? Yeah. Okay. Hi, it's Barry, Barry Rosen, uh, 5 Wonder Mayor Drive. I had a couple questions. I'm not sure which person to direct it to. Um, Just let him go. <laughs> okay, thanks, Joe. My first question is, what fuel will you be using or have you proposed for the generator? Diesel. Diesel? Ah, let me unmute. Yes. You're really, uh, what, what water protection zone are you in? We are in the... Ground, it's basically R2, Groundwater Protection District 3. Any chance you might switch to either natural gas or perhaps uh, propane? You're also very close to the wetland. So, can I answer that? Yes. One of the project goals was to not be on a natural gas uh, distribution system, which we were able to achieve through several uh, alternative energy uh, solutions that we've implemented into, into this design. Uh, the one uh, place that we weren't able to use renewable energy is the backup generator, as diesel is the most reliable available to us currently based on the, the what we're working with. So. Uh, uh, we, the design team wouldn't recommend using natural gas. Um, for a way not to use a petroleum product. Because in the winter time, you're going to have to winterize that petroleum product. The chemical you put in there, it's, a, it's an absolute 
horror story. If it gets into the groundwater, it can't be removed. No way to remove it that we know of. Um, it's the same with cars that run on diesel. They, the diesel, uh, uh, most people I know, tends to gel in the wintertime. And so in the Northeast, uh, there's a chemical additive that's put into the diesel fuel that attempts until it gets very, very cold. In our area, it's able to keep the diesel fuel uh, as a gasoline uh, like like consistency. In the winter time, if there's ever a leak or a spill, unless you surround it, like we required Concord to surround theirs because they're near uh, a water recharge area uh, where they had their what they call their bus garage. Um, if there's a spill, it's catastrophic. The only way to avoid that is, is, is basically you, they call it a, they call it a coffin. <laughs> basically put a, put a protective coffin in around it and drop the fuel on the ground on a coffin so it can't spill. Um, or you go to propane, which has zero pollution possibilities. Even if it spills, it goes nowhere. Can't hurt, can't hurt groundwater, can't hurt, can't hurt, period. Just if you're near it, it's just cold. Um, but is there any consideration to looking at an alternative there? Particularly when you're, you're very close to a wet one. If you want, Joe, I, can, I can help with that a little bit. So the, um, the generator that is being specified, as we said, is a diesel generator. The uh, reason why is uh, certain National Electrical Code aspects where this is considered an essential facility i.e. in an emergency they need to be operational as john had uh, said earlier bringing natural gas um, onto the site where it's a public utility is often deemed not um, an independent source or on on site source um, so because if there was ever a rupture as happened recently um, the gas service has to be shut off your uh, fire department doesn't have a backup generator anymore. Um, the, there are regulatory requirements. This is an above ground called a belly tank. The diesel uh, generator actually is mounted on top of the tank. It is double walled with an alarm, multiple alarms inside of it. So if for any reason whatsoever that the inner tank ever let go, alarms would trigger within the station that they would know that they have to um, address the um, the tank in order to make sure that they didn't have a spill externally. Excuse me. Um, to answer the question about a propane, there is a certain point where the propane generators uh, a do not are not or natural gas propane generators. Um, are not cost effective and cannot handle the loading that the building would be um, requiring because the entire building is backed up. We could look into that, but then the combustibility of the um, propane being above ground is another concern to uh, and where to place that because that wouldn't be able to live underneath the the tank the uh, the generator. Propane tanks can go underground. We use them. <laughs> Dean? Yeah, the, uh, just, just to give us some history on this, uh, this is the same sort of discussion we had with the generator for the public safety building. Uh, we went with the diesel air, same considerations as far as the alarming situation as far as the uh, power potential of having propane, uh, the diesel works better. We also have similar diesel fired generators at all three of our existing stations. We had originally had very small natural gas ones inside the buildings. We moved all of them outside, standalone units, uh, insulated cabinets, uh, double wall tanks. So. This is exactly in keeping with what the uh, town's longstanding practice has been. If you go with diesel, uh, 
like to see you do something that we asked, actually we required Concord to do, even though it was on their land. It, it was on our, our zone too. Uh, basically above ground, uh, but they surrounded it. So even if it leaked, it wasn't, it's not going to go anywhere. They don't believe it will, and their engineers don't believe. Um, basically, they walled it off, uh, and they had a similar problem. They they uh, they're running a a bus garage repair, car wash, everything uh, for the town, but it's it's uphill from uh, Acton's land. So if something could be done to just make sure it's protected. Things rupture, but by the time you rupture and get to the rupture, it runs. And uh, you've got impervious pavement, so it's going to flow along that pavement really quickly. Which, you know, not, I don't want to believe or just consider. Um, I, I also want to ask if there's, uh, and of course, I don't know the detail of the plans. If you're going to do something to capture... Uh, some or all of the water that runs off the, the building's footprint is pretty large, um, as, as it needs to be. Um, can you or are you going to capture the runoff from the building? Which is a relatively cheap thing to do. We asked for and got uh, another a 40B that's a large 40B that's going to be built. Hope they think that will be built. And Acton, if they could do that, and they agreed. They're basically going to capture all their impervious water and get it back into the ground at the powder mill place. Um, I negotiated with them, and they're doing it. They put it into the plans, and we got them committed in writing. So they're going to capture all the runoff, and it's going to go back into the ground. In fact, they're going to use it. They're going to store it, and they're going to use it for irrigation instead of using Acton Town water. Uh, this is Dave McKinley. I can't answer that question. Oh, we do have roof drains picking up all of the water, and they do go into the infiltration beds underneath the parking. Uh, there's the, what you saw on the civil plan basically showed overflows from those infiltration beds. So it's only if they fill up uh, from most rains, uh, they'll never drain into the wetland. It'll basically just uh, try to infiltrate through into the groundwater. So we are. We're not using it for irrigation. The, the site is kind of small for that, and we don't have any place to really put it on the surface. So we're doing the best we can to infiltrate that rainwater as well as the inf uh, the um, impervious asphalt. Okay, you do have a tough site to build on. <laughs> I know the site. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, there's one other member of the public, uh, John, one second. <clears throat> Uh, Jim, hi, this ahead. is Jim Spider-Grant. Oh, hi, uh, Jim. Hi. Hi. Yes. yes. Um, just a, a few quick questions. I was wondering where on the site the wells are going to be for the ground source heat pump? That is a very good question. Um, John, can you pull the... <laughs> yeah. If it's a pain to, to, to bring the actual map up, I'm happy to just have a description. Okay. Um, basically, they will be underneath the drive that is to the left-hand side of the building. Oh, okay. Great. Um, the other question was, um, in terms of um, special permit requirements, um, I'm thinking there's uh, you have enough parking there to require normally uh, um, uh, bicycle parking. So I'm wondering where the bike rack is. Uh, the bike rack is, uh, the, the flagpole is on the southwest corner of the main building in the little tan area, and the bike rack is uh, right next to that. Oh, great. Thanks. That was, one of, that was one of the comments was... that was brought up by the AG. <laughs> it's, okay, not, it's not in the image. Though, um, it's, okay. it's on the That's plan. Fine. I, 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 totally, I totally get that. It's a wonderful place for a bike rack. Um, the last question was, um, have you, have you done the energy modeling yet to understand, um, how much electricity will be used? We have, um, 
I do not have those numbers from the top of my head. I apologize. That's fine. Just I just I just wanted to make sure it had been done, since that will help figure out the sizing for the solar panels. Mm -hmm. Great. All my questions. Thank you. Anyone else, David? Um, just a second. Nope, nobody else. Okay. Any quest more questions from the board? So just process-wise, we just need to approve these three special permits? Yes. Okay, and, and there's not a larger, because we're a municipality, it's a municipal project, we don't need the typical. So um, so what I think, as, as Mr. Barry mentioned earlier, a lot of times there'll be a draft decision that's included for your consideration in this case. Uh, it wasn't included, but it can be it can be drafted and, and put on the consent agenda at a, at a future meeting if if you're comfortable approving the the site plan as is with the three special con, uh, requests that were presented earlier. So my question was, do we need to approve um, a site plan special permit? No, I think we just need the three special <laughs> issues approved. Or, or Peter, what would be the answer to the question? Uh, I have, I will get you an answer. Robert, I think so I, Robert, my question was, do, do we need, because it's a, it's a town project, must we get um, a site plan special permit from the town? I, I thought, and I, I haven't looked at the zoning bylaw, but it was my understanding that municipal projects were exempt from zoning. Um, if we do have to uh, approve a site plan special permit, it's one permit that would have waivers of the zoning bylaw for all three of those issues. Um, I don't like voting on, on documents that I haven't seen. So, uh, if, if, if a site plan is required, I would like to see a decision that goes through the zoning bylaw, says what the zoning bylaw requires, says what the standards are for granting uh, waivers of those, and um, applies those standards to these particular waivers, and then has a final decision to it. Um, so, John's, I have no problems with them, but I, I'm not voting for a document that I haven't seen anymore. Okay, John, can we hold this till the next meeting? Uh, certainly, I think the, the, I think the, absolutely. Okay. It, it, just to, to, to the question or the, the point that was raised, it is not required, uh, but we, we brought it forward just as a, as a way to, to keep the process going. And if you want to have the, the decision before you before you decide on these things we can we can work on that what, yeah, what was me. what was robert hummel's comment that just flashed on the screen <laughs> that was me asking him to comment i believe and his comment was i don't think he responded Hold on. he did yeah, respond. no, he's got a comment here the board can approve the site plan special permit close the hearing and vote next meeting uh, close the hearing, vote on conditions next meeting. I'm fine with that, but but on the other hand, if if the if the if the municipal properties are exempt from the zoning bylaw, we could just approve the site plan and concept. I'm not sure why we want to approve a site plan that isn't required by the zoning bylaw. All right. Well, John will get back to us next week. Is that all right with everyone? Well, I think, yeah, if it's, if that's what uh, you want to do, then absolutely. So we right. did Dean, a question. Dean, wait a minute, Dean, I'm recognizing Dean. Yeah, I, I, I'm remembering back from previous projects. I don't ever remember a, an actual uh site plan special permit issued for things like the public safety building or the memorial library. 
Uh, there is an exemption there uh, in the zoning bylaw, I believe, that basically for the use, uh, but we still have to comply with the dimensional requirements under uh, the zoning bylaw, unless things have changed uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, I think what what would be best is if we close the hearing and then we just wait for the draft decision that we can vote on uh, next week. I okay. agree with that. All right. Any other comments? All right. Is there a motion to close the hearing? Yes. So moved. So moved. All right. Is, all right. Second. John Benson made the motion and Dean seconded. Any further discussion? Will the clerk call the roll? Mr. Berry. Aye. Mr. Martin. Aye. Mr. Benson. Aye. Ms. Gardner. Aye. Mr. Trotter. Aye. Unanimous. Okay. The housing production plan timeline is the next agenda item. Yeah. Um, you all, uh, I think yesterday morning received a note from Kristen Gashard. Um, due to the fact there were so many um, comments made, as it turned out, uh, there were about 246 unique comments from 41 commenters. And um, <laughs> they were not able to um, complete the revised draft by last Friday. That was the date it was due to be posted. Uh, we are meeting tomorrow morning. This would be uh, planning uh, the consultants, Nancy Tavernier, Ray Yacobi, and myself um, to take stock of where we are um, and uh, propose another timeline. It would appear to be like this. The um, the revised draft should be available um, for posting um, um, a week from today. That would be May 19th. Um, we could give it then a week for people to, to read it, for us to review it and digest it, and then have a further joint board hearing um, the following um, Tuesday, May 26th. That would be the day after Memorial Day. Um, I think we all got behind um, the spirit of, of Dean's comment um, um, that, you know, let's take the time um, and do this right. There's no need to rush it. Um, just note that the uh, our current HBP will lapse on May 19. Uh, we were assured by Liz Rust um, that there was no risk in letting it lapse. Uh, specifically, we wouldn't be uh, putting in jeopardy um, our current uh, two-year safe harbor. So um, uh, I would just follow on to Dean and let's sort of take the time that we need. If the timeline is next Tuesday for the report to be issued and then another uh, joint uh, meeting you know, on May 26th, does that make sense to all? Does to me. Peter? Yeah, I, I think, I, I thought I heard you say that the HPP lapses on May 19th. I think yes, it's actually, it does. Yes. I think it's July 19th. No, no. For submitting it to, uh, to the state was May 19th because they needed 60 days to review it and approve it. So uh, if we no. don't get it in by May 19th, it will go beyond the deadline, but I thought it was in July. When it uh, no, five years yeah, we, we, we did a follow-on question with Liz uh, the last time. Um, it, it, it's it's got to be in on, on the 19th because it lapses that day. Then the state has up to 90 days to review the, um, okay. the, the, the new plan. But the big thing okay. is there's no risk in, it, in letting it right. lapse. Yeah, and I, I, I understand that. Yeah, okay. David? Yeah, um, uh, John, is there a specific way that uh, town entities are supposed to provide feedback, the various committees and um, uh, the water district, other uh, other town entities when they have, because they, they're meeting at different schedules, right? And so 
Uh, is there a method they just submit comments like anybody else? Yes, um, the, the water district did submit um, a very significant comment um, about you know certain encroachments on land um, abutting the you know ideas to build on land that abut the water district or particularly where oh uh, on Esterbrook Road where there's no public water supply and you know talking and and, and yeah, they had sure. some very uh, uh, focused comments. How about the other various other committees in town? Um, I think they would submit comments in the ordinary course with everyone else. Okay. Um, would you have any, would you no, like I, it I, I, think that, I think that's a good way. I just wanted to be clear because I think some committees were not clear. Okay. Uh, are there any committees we should, uh, I sh we should reach out and touch base with? Um, I know of the um, historical commission wants to consider it at their next meeting, um, which I think is going to be sometime this month during the day. Um, they were not able to get an evening time. I think there it might be the, also the twenty sixth. Okay, so they're meeting on five twenty six. Okay, I, I think um, I just by memory. Um, to have everyone, to make sure everyone's heard, you wouldn't mind, people wouldn't mind if if our next joint meeting with the planning board would go into June, just to make sure everyone's heard. Yeah, that's fine. Peter? Yeah, just so I understand, the public comment period is closed or can, can citizens keep commenting? Um, I mean, that's the, a different um, for the committees, maybe. But well, well, the way we left it was the public comment period uh, closed with our meeting on May four. Um, the plan was for the uh, report, the revised draft, to be posted last Friday, the ninth, for us to meet again this evening. Um, with the discretion in the two boards whether they wanted to take further public comments. So I, I think that's probably open. We may want to limit comments to, to comments that haven't already been heard. Is there anything new to add? Okay. I, I mean, I to answer your specific question, I, I don't have a problem with extending it a couple more weeks uh, and allowing boards uh, and inviting comments from town boards. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Okay. Discussion regarding COVID and board and committee requests. Green Advisory Board wants to meet. So should they check with Technical staff on time available? Well, I, I think, yeah, we just got to formally, in keeping with our our our, um, our protocol, uh, that we just have a vote uh, permitting them to get in the meeting sequence, and then they would work that out with John. Okay. Is there Peter? Uh, yeah, the BCC is also wanting to meet. I don't. I'm not sure we have voted them. Uh, we did. Them. To, they have. Huh? Did we? I think we did. I'm sorry. They have a. We did. Is that what you're saying? I believe we did. Yeah, I think they've they've met okay. already, haven't they? Met. No, they're supposed to meet tomorrow. They've done it. They're going through the uh, reappointments of uh, of terms okay. that have expired. I I I. Didn't know whether we had or not. If we have, that's fine. I don't have well, well, why don't we just include them here? It doesn't hurt to include them again. Yeah, they've been in touch with you, John, because uh, I know they have a meeting scheduled for tomorrow. Yeah, so basically, the to, to part, uh, committee chairs, are. Uh, we've asked them all to contact Lisa in, in our office, and Lisa is working on potential dates, and then we're making sure that we get before the board here before the date is finally okay. you know, We're working it all out, and once I, I, I suggest that you do include BCC just in case uh, okay. the other ones you're considering tonight. Okay, is there a we, motion? I move that David? we allow the Green Advisory Board and the BCC to meet. Virtually. 
Virtual. Motion made and seconded. Will the clerk call the roll? Mr. Martin. Aye. Mr. Benson. Aye. Mr. Barry. Aye. Ms. Gardner. Aye. Mr. Trotter. Aye. Unanimous. Motion carries. Okay. Town meeting date and location. Uh, well, could, could we could we just back up in, in terms of any other COVID issues to talk about? I had one just to raise briefly. Okay. Okay. Um, we got a letter uh, yesterday, um, all of us from, from Bob Ferrara on behalf of the Democratic Town Committee um, um, asking us um, uh, uh, to consider their motion to encourage the Acton Board of Selectmen to use Community Preservation Act money for rental assistance for residents affected by the COVID-19 um, um, pandemic. Um, um, and they go on, uh, we realize there are other well-reasoned and good faith viewpoints which differ and normally we do not comment on any town issues. However, in these unprecedented times, our members felt this action is warranted to maintain our community as uh, so many in Acton face job loss due to the pandemic. If this passes, we trust the Board of Selectmen will develop a sound mechanism for the distribution of any funds. Um, I know this had come up in the in the HPP plan and you know, over, I think, um, objections of, of Dean and uh, they, they did take that out. Um, I just wanted to know uh, whether how I how I uh, should should respond to this because it was a request, um, you know, you know, to the board, not just an informational type question. Dean, yeah, I I'd, I'd like to address a couple of the the issues there. Um, first, some of the technical issues behind that. Um, number one. There, there is no pot of money available right now without going to town meeting. There's been no application made to the CPA, CPC uh, for those funds. Uh, CPC is not planning on meeting uh, anytime soon. So there's, there's no status by which we can review this. The, uh, all of the projects that uh, CPA or CPC reviewed we made recommendations, which we're going to bring to town meeting. Essentially, that expends all about all of the funds that are available uh, with a small margin. Uh, so there's there's no money allocated. There's no application in hand. There is, so far as I can see, no process by which you could even discuss this. Uh, Money cannot be appropriated at town meeting without the recommendation of the CPC, which none of which we have in hand. We don't, at this point, don't know when the town meeting is going to occur and then when such meeting might be available. Uh, so I think, you know, as a philosophical statement, it's fine, but I think there are some severe um, logistical problems with this. Uh, and then we can certainly address the whole larger issue of how do we decide who needs money if you're going to do a handout. Uh, next op option might be, gee, there's a lot of seniors that are having a hard time paying their taxes, so maybe they should get some money. Uh, or you can come up with all sorts of other scenarios for people that should be given money. The objections I've raised over the last two meetings still occur in that the purpose behind CPA is to provide uh, items of enduring value, bricks and mortar affordable housing, open space, historic preservation projects. Uh, however laudable this might be to help somebody with their rental bill at the end of the month, that money is gone. It's a misdirection of what everybody thinks CPA should be. And frankly, there's logistic issues to it. I think there's philosophical issues to it. If somebody wants to get started with this, it should go through the normal budgeting process with the town. 
if you want to decide that this is an affordable housing operation, then we have to look, revisit some of the issues of the money that uh, CPA has already recommended for this year. So it's taking money away from things like uh, the housing authority project on Main Street or something else. So I think this is a, a very bad idea to bring up this time. It's a knee jerk reaction. And I'm totally opposed to this. Did you Any also say comments? that there, there is no money in the uh, hello, hello, Joan? Hi, hello. we're here. Uh, Joan? Yes, we're here. Yeah, okay. Um, so, so Dean, as so I'm clear, um, in the uh, in the community housing portion of the CPC account, there is no money available. There is no hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That's whatever they would want to put into this particular fund that they're asking for this program. Oh, God. CPC. Uh, has we, made their recommendations. C CPC has made their recommendations. They voted everything. So presumably what you're asking is that we go back and reconsider all of the applications. Uh, there's no magical. No, I was money asking you. No, I'm not asking that. that. Someplace that you can just reach into. No, that was my question. There's no, there, there, money, there's no whatever the. That's okay. There's no money that's available. Is that correct? Right. That's what it, I'm hearing. Okay. No money. There's no money available unless it's appropriated by town meeting. Mm -hmm. David. David. So I, I, I yeah, David? I'm here. I think this proposal is yes. I'm here. Uh, I think this proposal is fraught with problems. Uh, the town doesn't know renters. In other words, we don't deal with renters. We deal with property owners. So that would be an, a new thing uh, for us. We don't have any standards to just ju judge who's deserving uh, of assistance. Um, we'd have to in invent those or, or find those. Um, I, I personally, you know, I've heard the suggestion that we give a chunk of money to the United Way to do this. Um, I'm personally unwilling to put the town's money in the hands of a private entity to judge who's deserving. Um, uh, I believe that also the town is too small to do this kind of thing. This should be the realm of the state legislature and, and the state legislature should be giving people uh, uh, rental assistance if that's what's, what's needed. Um, I believe that the town should continue to support and in fact, you know, uh, and, you know, through the mechanisms des described in the HPP and other areas, um, uh, low income housing, and we should do more of that. But I, I don't believe in this proposal. Peter, did you have a comment? Peter? Uh, yeah, we have, yep. Can you hear me? Okay. We have an yes, agenda yes. item later on tonight that deals with the exact issue. The ACHC is proposing taking $10,000 of their grant money and uh, authorizing the town's uh, community services uh, worker, uh, Laura Deschamps, mm -hmm. to uh, make determinations about, not a private entity, the town's social worker, to make uh, determinations about uh, deserving recipients of uh, assistance for mortgage uh, payments, for uh, rental uh, payments that they might not be able to make because they've been laid off. I mean, we have been talking a lot about uh, businesses. One of the reactions we got to that is it ought to be spread to other uh, people who are in need, not just the small businesses. Certainly the need is spread far and wide. I got a call from Jamie Eldridge uh, asking me exactly that question. I think he was asking about a possible bill uh, to authorize uh, CPC funds to be used to help short-term uh, emergency rental assistance for people who have been particularly affected by this terrible uh, 
pandemic we're in. Uh, it seems to me that's a big difference between a long-term plan to provide rental assistance on a general basis over uh, several years, to, to attack the problem uh, that uh, people are experiencing through no fault of their own for a short-term period to try to help them through this emergency is a very different prospect. We could go to um, a fall town meeting, which we'll have anyway, and uh, file an application with the CPC and ask the CPC to uh, vote to uh, uh, make a recommendation to town meeting. That's completely up to the CPC. Town meeting can't vote CPC money unless uh, CPC makes a recommendation to them. But I, I do see some benefit in this, and I see a way that it can be done using the, own, the town staff uh, to make those kind of determinations. So uh, you can tell the Democratic Town Committee, uh, assuming this passes later on tonight, that we have approved uh, $10,000 from the ACHC uh, gift account. That's uh, private donations that uh, citizens have made to the ACHC to provide this exact kind of benefit. Uh, and uh, I, I'm gonna argue that we keep the, uh, the, uh, the issue on the table uh, through the housing production plan and possibly through all town meeting. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Well, thank you. I, I, I have enough to respond uh, politely and appropriately. Okay. Any other COVID issues before we move on? Okay. Town meeting. John? Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we, I think the town meeting was obviously supposed to be April 6th. The board voted to postpone it. And up until now, we haven't had a discussion necessarily about when we would want to hold it. Uh, the, the legislature did provide for communities like ours to adopt a 1 12th budget uh, and allow us to delay town meeting further into the summer if we choose to uh, in working with our finance team and trying to understand how mu that might work. Uh, we really see the benefit to trying to have a town meeting held before the end of the fiscal year. Uh, it, would, it would certainly help us uh, with how we, how we do things internally. And we're not sure when we'll get additional information to give us any better sense of the, um, the financial outlook from the state revenue standpoint. Um, so we feel that we can come forward with um, some budget information for you to consider uh, in time to have a meeting held before the end of the fiscal year. Our neighbors in Boxborough are holding their town meeting June 22nd. Um, so that's already been scheduled and, and they're, they're actually holding it at their, uh, the Regency Hotel, the Boxborough Regency. They hold it, it's a bigger space than where they usually hold their town meetings and they're spreading people apart. Um, so the purpose of having this on the agenda tonight is to hear, hear from the board, to hear any thoughts you have about when we could hold or when we should hold a town meeting. Uh, and if uh, directed to do so, I will work with Mark and Eva and the moderator and anyone else to, to come back to you uh, next week with a plan for how we would do it, um, if, if that's what you'd like me to do. David? Yes, I, I think we should have our town meeting before the end of the, the fiscal year. Um, I don't think there's going to be much difference in conditions between June and August or September. And so I don't see, you know, waiting and doing one twelfth allocations every, every month. Um, uh, I also know that there's the issue of swearing in the new um, uh, uh, town officials that are going to be elected on the on June 2nd, you know, both members of this board and members of the regional school committee. Um, so um, I, I believe that we should we should uh, go for it. I'm happy to have the town meeting on the football field or in a large location or just distributed through classrooms. <laughs> Uh, in the high school or whatever makes sense. Um, but I think we should uh, move ahead. You know, June 22nd is a, is a, is a good date or, uh, you know, somewhere in that neighborhood. Other comments from the board? Um, yeah. 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 John? Um, I, I saw that um, from, yeah, from for Murray and Maxwell's uh, column, uh, Concord, um, continued um, their June 22nd town meeting um, to sometime in late July or ideally in late September. 
Um, and the, you know, the basic reason was they uh, ensuring everyone's um, um, safety. Uh, would we envision a, um, I think we have some option to have like a limited warrant where we just limited it to budgets and perhaps selected other articles. Is that something, John, you've, we, we've thought about? Well, the, the, the board, it's the board's warrant. Um, yeah. and with the exception of citizen petitions, which were already filed, which I probably, which I believe would probably have to be um, heard unless we hear otherwise from town council. Uh, you can certainly as a board determine how you want to pare down the warrant to make it more manageable if you wanted to make it a shorter meeting. And, you know, we'd be happy to work on, on ways and make recommendations for how to do that. Um, it, it looks like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm All right. Yeah, just, it looks, it looks like it was a, um, a not a pretty non-controversial warrant, um, with probably half of the articles, um, um, on consent. Is that how it's lining up? Still lining up, John? Yeah, I think we were in the 40 range, uh, and I think close to 20 were consent items. Yeah, that's about right. Okay. Okay. Peter? Uh, yeah, I think the governor signed that bill, uh, John, which does allow us to uh, pare down the warrant and not consider the citizens' articles. So uh, you need to check with Nina, obviously. But um, that was my understanding. Whether we would need to do that or not, um, I guess, is part of the mix of figuring out what the safest way to do this is. Um, uh, the budget is another issue. There are towns that are um, changing their budgets before they go to town meeting. I, I'm, my understanding from talking to John is that this year is not a problem. Uh, we won't have a state budget probably by July 1st. Um, uh, Local aid in the, on the town side is not a huge uh, issue as far as the budget goes, but it certainly is on the school side. Um, I, I understand Boxborough's town meeting has, uh, they're reducing their school budget to, to a certain extent. Uh, but but uh, again, in talking to John, we could pass the budget. I know that, I know the ILG is meeting, so they'll certainly take this up, but um, we could pass the budget and uh, if uh, revenues uh, drop drastically next year, um, assuming we have a special town meeting in the fall, we could amend the budget if we have to. We have a bottom line budget anyway. We don't, we're don't. we not required to spend every dollar um, that gets appropriated. So um, those are just kind of my thoughts about what's happening. Okay. Any, Dean? Dean, yeah, do you have I, a comment? Uh, yes. Um, yeah, I I would favor having a a, a town meeting in uh, in late June, and looking at the warrant, I don't think I agree with uh, Mr. Benson. It's not very controversial. I think there's some important business we have to conduct in addition to the budget. We've got uh, some appropriation for Kelly's Corner to continue to keep that project on track. So. Uh, I think we uh, we plan on a one night meeting, and uh, hopefully, people will make their comments short. Okay, sounds like this consensus, John, to go for yeah. a June town meeting. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, just just on that last thought, though, the way that we outlined the warrant before, it certainly wasn't planning on one night. Um, so we'd have to either work with the moderator on on how to make it fit in one night. Uh, you know, you recall, we, there was a whole process with some great recommendations from a citizen group uh, and, and that uh, we were, were gonna make the end of the time certain and all those things. So I guess if we're temporarily suspending all those, those ideas, which we think were good in the long term, and focusing on how to get a meeting done in one night, if that's the goal, we can, we can work on that and come back with a plan for you. One um, night and safely. <laughs> Done. <laughs> All right. so, so, John, perhaps we could start a little bit earlier to fit it in one night, um, um, or even move it to a weekend if that made sense. But um, uh, uh, you know, what, what, whatever, whatever you think makes sense in in your in your proposal. Okay, so we'll hear back from you on this issue. 
Yes, we'll have something for you Tuesday. Great. Thank you. All right. Anything else before we move to the consent items? All right. Consent items seven, approve executive session meetings, April 14th, 2020. Approve meeting minutes, April 21st and 28th, 2020. Board to accept requests for spending up to $10,000 from the ACHC discretionary fund for emergency housing needs in the community. Hold. Accept gift. Hold. All right. Accept gift Council on Aging for $100 from Susan Hunt for the Council on Aging gift fund. So is there a motion to approve 7, 8, and 10? So moved. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Motion made and seconded. Will the clerk call the roll? Uh, Mr. Martin. Aye. Mr. Benson. Aye. Mr. Berry. Aye. Ms. Gardner. Aye. Ms. Trotter, aye, unanimous. Thank you. And who held? I I held. Who held? Um, okay. The uh, the only thing I'd like to point out, I don't have the memo in front of me, but I believe I read through it, and I think the memo was clear that uh, these funds are from their discretionary funds. They're from donations. They're not from CPC money. And uh, I just want it to be understood that this would not be considered a precedent because I believe there are no CPA monies involved in this $10,000 request, um, which I otherwise approve of. I think it's a great idea. I just wanted to clarify that point. Okay. Is there a motion to approve consent item nine? So uh, moved. I have a comment, John. David? Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, this is a little bit different for me than um, uh, doing uh, CPC money. First of all, this is a pretty modest amount of, of money. And some of the other objections that I had about um, uh, 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 developing standards and things um, are really not necessary with this modern, uh, a modest amount of money. Um, uh, the proposal here is that uh, L Laura would determine you know, the people in, in need. And I think that's um, a, a reasonable process for emergency money. And, and so I, I'm, I'm in favor of this. Okay, any other discussion? It's something we can do. We'll look, look. It's something we can do in the short term. Yeah, all right, Dean, will you call the roll please? Yes, I will. It wasn't Mr. seconded. Barry. Was it seconded? I'll Excuse second me. the motion. Okay. Okay, Mr. Berry. Aye. Aye. Mr. Martin. Aye. Miss, Mr. Benson. Aye. Ms. Gardner. Aye. Mr. Trotter. Aye. Unanimous. Thank you. Is there anything else to come before the board? Uh, just our next meeting, which will be a week from tonight at 7 o'clock. John's nodding his head, yeah. yes. We're tracking Tuesdays for the rest of this month, uh, looks okay. like. And when is the um, ALG meeting? Wednesday the, Wednesday, the tw Wednesday the 20th at 8, 8 a.m. Okay. Anything else to come before the board? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. David, Seconded. David moved and John seconded. Any further discussion? Will the clerk call the roll? Mr. Martin? Aye. Mr. Benson? Aye. Mr. Berry? Aye. Ms. Gardner? Aye. Mr. Trotter? Aye. Unanimous. Thank you all. Have a good week. Good night. Bye.